This morning, the title of the message is, God our Savior, not in me, all in him. And uh, for those of you who are new to us this morning, we want you to see the context and review. Take your outline and notice there with me, right under the words context and review, it says, the Apostle Paul has left missionary Titus on the island of Crete to straighten out wayward churches. So they had churches there even in the first century that were messed up and they needed to be straightened out. Those churches had problematic leaders, doctrine, and behavior. When you study the Bible, it's good to know what the context of the scripture you're studying is. If you study the book of Titus, you need to understand that they didn't have good leaders, they didn't have sound doctrine, and they weren't acting like Christians. And that's why Titus was left there to straighten it out. We have many churches in the same condition today all around us here, not only in America, but in Europe and around the world. Many churches have gotten off track. We need to come back to what the truth is. We need the right leaders. We need the right doctrine. And we need to act like Christians. And so that's part of what this letter is all about. And therefore it applies to Sheridan Hills. We need to be very careful that we allow the truth of God's word to be affecting who we are as a church. Notice the next statement that is on there. The life of church members is to be, do you remember what we said last week? Distinctly Christian. Our life that we live should be distinctly Christian while in the surrounding culture. Jesus said, I do not pray that you take them out of the world. We are to be in the world, but we are not to be of the world, like the world. In fact, this world is passing away, but the truths of God are eternal. And the values of God are worth our sacrifice in order to pursue his plan for not only our salvation, but the way that we live. And so the life of church members should be distinctly Christian. It should be obvious that you're a Christian. Now this, put out there to the side, this does not mean odd for God. There's some people that just, you know, they wear two different color socks because they want everybody to know they're a Christian. That's weird. Don't be weird. We don't need more weird Christians. We don't need people that re wear their Christianity on their sleeve as, as, you know, something that you are trying to draw attention to in that way, especially to yourself. But we are called to live according to what God's Word says. Notice the next dot line that is there. When we live a distinct, distinct life, here's the idea. This is a powerful witness for showing Christ to a godless culture like Crete, or as we said last week, like South Florida. Um, a lot of people don't share our values. A lot of people don't share our lifestyle. A lot of people um, are really living for what they're going to drive or how they're going to look or how they're going to wear or where they're going to go on vacation or all of these other things that are very temporal. They're very temporary. True Christians are to live their lives in light of what God's Word says about all of eternity, not just about this life. And so we are seeking to live by faith in the things that God has said, honoring Him and seeking Him in each day. So how do we do that as we, as we remember the passage from last week and as we remember the other passages throughout the book of Titus, I want us to come to the passage this morning in the box on the page. Now, the first two verses are what we looked at last week, and then the underlined verses are what I'm going to preach through this morning very quickly, and then verses 8, 9, and 10, and 11 will be for next week. But let's look and let's see the passage in the box on the page. In verse 1, we saw last week, it says in Titus chapter 3, verse 1, remind them to be submissive to rulers. Titus is being told to tell the churches what to do, that they are to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. Now the point is that he's saying you are to look different than the Crete around you. The Crete, the people that were throughout Crete around them were not submissive. They were not obedient. They were not ready to be a service to others. They were not courteous. They were known as a very rough people. And what he is saying is, if you're Christians and you live in Crete 
and you, you call yourself a Christian in the body of Christ, you need to live like it. Now look at verse 3, where we go this morning. Circle the word for. So that's a linking idea to the rest of the passage that just came before it. So there were these instructions given in 1 and 2, and now we come to verse 3. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. Now that's a mouthful in verse 3. He's saying, look, we used to be just like the people that are out there in the Cretan culture. We were just like everybody else that's come in from all over the Mediterranean world, and they're just kind of living for the here and now. They're sleeping with whoever they want to sleep with. They're, they're just really uh, twisting things, the truth, and they're just kind of going along to get along where they have to. And, I mean, there's all kinds of uh, bad business deals. I mean, we, we know that they weren't people of truth. They would lie and rip people off. They were known as that. They were known as shysters in the Mediterranean world. And so what they're saying is, look, we used to all do the same thing, but when we came to Jesus, everything changed. And so that, that's why Christians should look different than the world. We aren't living for the here and now. We are living for eternity. We're living according to a different set of values. So in verse 3, he's saying, look, for we ourselves were once like this. Look at verse 4, another linking word. But, circle the word but. But, see, we used to be like that, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, I love it, look at verse 5. He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to what? His own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Christ Jesus, our Savior. It's the second time the word Savior shows up. Verse 7, so that being justified by His grace, that means being made right by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. That means that you inherit all that God has in eternal life. We are truly experiencing the changed life and the promises of God. So, I've said this before, and just kind of look up right here at the end of my nose for a minute. We need, we need to understand this. Cultural Christianity is always looking for the do's and the don'ts of what you, what you got to do and what you can't do in order to look good in being a Christian. So there's there sets of rules. There's sets of lists of things that you can do and that you shouldn't do, and those kind of change depending on the culture that the cultural Christianity is in. Now, we need to look beyond that and see that whenever God's Word gives rules or gives instructions, like we see in verses 1 and 2, that there's a good reason. It's not because you're going to be moralistic, and it's not because you're going to be self-righteous. It's because God has a different set of values for you. He's already made you different. And so here's, here's the picture. Ephesians, the whole book of Ephesians, is about getting your practice to match your position. So verses 1 through 3 are all about your position in Christ, what Jesus has done for you. And verse, chapters 4, 5, and 6 are all about how to live it out. And so, if we miss all of the reasoning and the values behind instructions, like, like lists of make sure you're doing this and make sure you're doing that, then we'd simply become legalistic. But if we interpret all of those instructions and those rules based upon what God's grace has done in our life or His wisdom and His values in our life, then we're not living them for the wrong reasons of self-righteousness, but we're living them because this is who we are. 
And so that's very important for biblical Christians, biblically-minded Christians, to always keep in mind that we don't do these things in order... Because, you see, when we, lead, when we lead, read lists in the New Testament, there's a lot of people who come to church and they think, see, look at that. I'm just not like that. I can't do that. I try to do that, and I fail. Maybe it's about issues of sexual purity. There's, no, there's none here that have to deal with our sexuality, but in other places in the New Testament, you know, the, and we'll even see a couple of them this morning, but, but part of the picture is you're looking at these lists and you're going, well, I, I mean... I can't even do that. In fact, that doesn't even sound like fun to me. You know, isn't life about, you know, pleasure and enjoying life and all of that? The plaisir de vie, I mean, the French are really good at that and, and everything else. I mean, what, what about, you know, what about all of that? And we, what we have to recognize is, is that God's values are different. And for the true Christian, we begin to see that his glorious plan for us and his glorious values are totally worth our pursuit. And that when we are seeking to be disciplined, when we are seeking to not live like the world, it's not because something is being withheld from us, it's because God in his wisdom and in his goodness has shown us a better way. Now that doesn't mean that we look at everybody else and we look down our nose at them, we judge them. We looked at that last week. How can you, how can you love people to Christ that you hate? How can you condemn everyone around you and simply pass judgment on everyone around you and not love them to the gospel? We don't need angry Christians that hate everybody that's a pagan. What we need is joyful Christians that love those who remember, and they remember what it was like to be holding on to this world's values. And so that is what will win a culture to Christ. That is what will win our neighbors and our family members and our co-workers to Christ is when we allow the love of God to flow through us in such a way that we remember what it was like and we remember that he has called us. So, very quickly, and and warm up your pen because here we go. The reason and power by which we live, fill this in, the reason and power by which we live distinctly Christian lives, here it is, and this is the premise of the whole message. The premise of this passage this morning is this is that God gives us not only the reason to live a distinct life, but he also gives us the power to live a a distinct life. To live a life that doesn't just go with the surrounding flow. And here it is, that we live this distinct life, not in me, but all in him. This is so key for you. If you're a young man or a young woman and you're new to seeking to walk with God and you've been struggling and struggling to live a holy life, struggling to be faithful to God, struggling to be faithful in disciplines, listen, it's not in you that you live the Christian life. It's not in your strength, but it's all in his strength. Right out to the side, Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20 says, "For (laughs) it's not I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. He is the one who gives me the power. So it's not in me. And that's what this passage is showing us. Fill this in as well. The specific verse, instructions of verses 1 and 2 are not to be lived out in our own self-righteousness. This is what I'm saying. It, it, you don't come to the list of the New Testament and say, oh, I have to do this in my own strength and in my own self-righteousness. But we do it, fill this in, in Christ's righteousness. Not easy to say, but it's, it's, it's so important. The righteousness of Christ that has been given to us as Christians is the power and the reason by which we live a distinctly Christian life. It's not that you're just trying to do better. It's that he has come and made you new. He's made you to be different. He now lives within you and gives you the strength to rein in the desires or to rein in um, the, the grudges or the hate or the whatever it is that naturally bubble up in your fleshly heart. It's that he has come and made all things new. So notice this, that it's Christ's righteousness And here's a key word. This is a theological word that over the next few years, I hope you come to understand more and more, that has been imputed. That means that it has been pressed upon you. 
that the righteousness of Christ, the scripture tells us in multiple places, that listen to this, the righteousness of Christ is pressed upon his people. And so we're no longer in our righteousness, we are in his righteousness, and this happens by God's grace through our faith. And that's, a, that's an amazing concept as well, that you see it right here on the outline, and that comes from Ephesians 2, but it is God's grace, his unmerited favor, that he gives us Christ, and he gives us Christ's righteousness, and that comes as we believe him, and we trust in him, and we look to him, and even our faith comes from him. Um, so the beautiful thing is, is, is that it's all about what he has done, not about what we do. Now, this passage in verse 3 shows us, number one, as Christians, we need to clearly remember from where we came. Now, I want you to think about that. As Christians, we need to clearly remember from where we came. There's some Christians that have forgotten where they came from. They've forgotten what the Lord saved them out of. Now, this isn't always easy for everybody. I know for some people it's harder than others. If you've been saved for a real long time, maybe you've kind of forgotten what it was like whenever it was that you came to faith. Or maybe it's not that you've been a Christian for so long, but maybe for you it's difficult because, boy, before you became a Christian, it was really painful. And if you remember too much about it, it just hurts. And part of the Lord's grace in your life is that, you saved, that he saved you out of all of that. Well, praise the Lord. But to the degree that it is helpful to others, we need to remember God's grace in saving us out of our sin. Now, some of you, um, you kind of grew up in a Christian home. You heard the gospel young. You prayed to receive Christ young. You never did live a life of big rebellion or whatever it was. But you know what? For you, it's difficult because your, your lack of knowing Christ before you came to belief may not look very bad, but you still need to think theologically about where your heart was headed without Christ. That even in your own, what we would call relatively innocent heart, there was still a rebellious nature that had to be subdued by God's grace and his faith in your life. And so, however it comes, we need to remember what it's like to be without Christ. In fact, in 1 Corinthians, I want you to see this, chapter 6 and verse 9 through 11. This is a theme that comes up numerous times in Paul's writing that he's saying, you need to remember. But look at the passage that's on the screen in front of you. Paul is writing to the Corinthian people and he says, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral or idolaters or adulterers nor men who practice homosexuality, verse 10, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkard, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Look at verse 11. And such were some of you, but you were what? You were washed. You were sanctified. You were made right. That means just, that's justified. You were made right. Where? In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So this passage in 1 Corinthians 6 shows us that in the Corinthian church, there were all these people that liked the Cretan churches they had come in from out, of the, out in the world. They were pagans just like anyone else. And they used to be all these things. But God's truth changed them. He rescued them from a life of destruction that was headed to an, an, an eternity with the destruction. And so they're rescued from an eternity of destruction. How did that happen? It was all due to what Jesus did. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Now concerning spiritual gifts, and this is on the screen. Now concerning spiritual gift, bro gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to what? Can you imagine trading a carved thing made by human hands that are mute? I mean, I mean the, the, the idols are mute. They don't speak. Why would you choose a piece of stone or a piece of gold or a piece of 
you know, wood and say, this is my God, and it cannot speak. What a deceptive lie of the enemy. That, I mean, and you say, well, I would never do that. In fact, I would never worship anything like that. No, you just may drive what you worship. Or you may live inside what you worship. Or you may look forward and go through all the websites and the magazines in order to, to get to what you worship in vacation or lust or whatever it is. You see, I mean, before we get too hard on them carving idols and some things like that, we can, you know, it is possible to have the idol of our children. It is possible for parents to worship their children. And, and allow children to become the center of everything. The, you know, the child's needs and the child's desires and the child's this and child's that. You know, it's just a, a newborn baby or a, or a five-year-old or a 12-year-old or a 15-year-old or a 30-year-old. And we live our lives revolving around this child when God has said, oh no, oh no. You come and you idolize me. You come and you worship me. Me, I am the one who is not a fake God, but a true God who speaks. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 7 on the screen in front of you. In verse 1 it says, and you were dead. I've underlined that. It says, look what it says. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this, following the course of this world. Look what it says. Following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of dis disobedience. Verse 3, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Verse 4, love it. What does it say? But God. So you used to be like this, but God did something. Look what God does. But God, being rich in mercy, because of what? His great love, with which he loved us, for five, verse 5, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages, this is the coming eternity, he will show the immeasurable riches of his grace in the kindness towards us that are who? That are in Christ Jesus. Here's the picture. Is that you used to be like this, but you're not like this anymore, so don't act like that anymore. He's rescued from you from all of that. And it's just crazy that our flesh still wants to go back so easily to other things. And God just calls us to continue to choose his kingdom over our kingdom, to choose his eternity over this temporal, very, very shallow um, life. And so that's part of what we see here in this passage is that we're being called to remember. Now, fill these in very quickly as we go. Remembering um, where we came from, remembering who we were, can knock down our spiritual pride. You know, before you get too self-righteous, um, when you remember where you came from, you, you won't have very much spiritual pride. And not only that, remember, remembering can build up our compassion and patience. So that when you're looking at the young man or the young woman or the neighbor or whoever it is, or maybe it's your parents, you're looking at the people that you are so desiring that they would come to know Jesus. You need to have patience and compassion for them more than you need to simply judge them and write them off. And if you will remember what it was like before you came to faith, maybe you will have more patience and more compassion with them. And I believe that that's why Paul is telling the, the Cretan Christians, look, remember that you used to be just like these people that are around them, so be careful how you live and remember from where your grace comes. Look at verse two, or number two. As Christians, not only do we need to clearly remember, but we need to clearly realize how we got here. How did we become Christians? And that's what Paul is going after here. He's saying, I want you to live a certain way, and the reason I want you to live a certain way is because Jesus saved you to do that. And so don't keep going back to the way that the world lives. Look what it says. We need to realize how we got here. 
First of all, the first bullet point there is, realize that God's goodness and mercy is the only reason you are saved. It is only because he is a good and merciful God. No one is saved because of their own inherent goodness. The only reason that you're saved is because of his goodness. Look at the next bullet point there. Realize that God's appearance as Savior is the only way in which you are saved. So it's not only the reason you're saved, but it's the only way. Right out there to the side, John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so the only way that we're saved is the fact that it says that God is our Savior. Very good. I hear you turning over your sheet, turn over your sheet. Look at the next bullet point that is here. And we see this in verse 5. Look what it says there in verse 5. He saved us. Can you underline that up there on your outline in verse 5? He saved us. Now we need to realize in this passage that the issue at hand is eternally serious. I mean, it doesn't get any more serious than this. And the word saved is an extreme, desperate term. It's not that your life was made better through Christ. It's not that your life was made more whole through Christ. It's not, it's not that something good happened through Christ merely. It is that you were eternally secured and saved from destruction in Christ. You see, this is, fill it in, a matter what we call of life and death. And even more than a matter of physical life and death, this is a matter of life and death spiritually. You know, it's one thing to die physically, but it is another thing to die spiritually, being eternally separated from God and to go into a Christless eternity where you pay for your sins in eternity. That is what God's grace saves us from, being cut off from him. Isaiah 59 says, your sins have cut you off from God and separated you from God. Something has to deal with that. And the only way to deal with that, we see, is through the salvation of God in his son, Jesus Christ. Look at the next statement here. It is a matter of salvation versus condemnation. You're either going to be saved and have the salvation of God or you're going to be condemned. Now the beautiful picture here is, is that the, these terms are very clear throughout the New Testament. That there's no, there's no hiding the fact Jesus is not just making you a better you. Jesus is saving you from you. And he's saving you for his glory. Look at the next bullet point that is here. We also see in this is that we realize that salvation is always God's doing and never our doing. It's always God's doing and never our doing. And this also comes out of verse 5. Look up there in verse 5. We just saw the beginning of it. It says, he saved us. But look at the next part in verse 5. In fact, would you read the next part out loud with me from verse 5 where it says not. Okay, you ready? Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. So fill this in. Our salvation is always God's doing, and it's never our doing. It's not by our works. Now we see this in Psalm 13, 5 and Psalm 51, verse 12. Both of them speak of God's salvation, not just my salvation. It's not that I'm not saving myself or it's all focused on me. It's all focused on the glory of God in this. Specifically, we want to say and make very clear, fill this in, specifically, we are not saved by our works. We are not saved by our works. In fact, I want you to see Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Usually we only quote 8 through 9, but I want you to see 8, 9, and 10. Carefully look at this with me in verse 8. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one should boast, or no one may boast. For we are whose workmanship? You see, he is the one who did it. He not only makes us, but he saves us. Look what it says. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. 
So there's this beautiful picture that God has not only made you for his salvation, calling you to himself, redeeming you from before the foundation of the world, a concept that is just is mind-blowing the more we start to think about it. But listen to this. He did it because he's got a plan for you to do good works. He's got a plan for you to show the world who he is. He's got a plan for you to live a distinct life so that you can be a blessing to others, changing them from not being into a Christless eternity, but a Christ-full eternity, an eternity filled with all of the goodness and grace of God. So notice this with me. Salvation by human works, fill this in, is the most prevalent misunderstanding or distortion of the gospel. This is the greatest misunderstanding that the world has about how we can know God. We, we, we think, well, it's through human works. It's through doing the right thing. I just finished sharing the gospel. Next door with starting point, the very first thing that we cover is how is it that we can truly come to know God? It is not through good works. It is not through our own righteousness. It is not through our prayers and through our disciplines and through all of these things. Those may be good things, but that is not how we come to know God, and that is the greatest misunderstanding of all. When you ask people out here on the street, how is it that you come to know God, they will always say, well, you know, you've got to do good. You've got to have faith. You know, you know, if you haven't murdered anyone, that's probably going good for you, and some other things like that. You know, maybe, maybe is, if you go to church, you help the poor, you help others, um, you know, you, you seek to do these things. None of those things are bad. All of those things are good. It's just that if you depend upon those things, you're going to go to hell. When you trade your righteousness for Christ's righteousness and you say no thanks to God, got it on my own, he says, no, you don't. You're not one of mine. The only way you can be one of mine is if you come to me through my sacrifice for your sins. And then you're one of mine. And you're one of mine surely and forever. And there's nothing that can ever change it. And I've already planned all kinds of great, great ways to use you and work in your life and to show you my glory and to show you my goodness. So this is the picture. Look at the next part here. Salvation by God's grace is what most distinguishes true Christianity from other religions. Salvation by the fact that it is simply by the goodness and the mercy of God that it's not that you're working off your sins or it's not that you're working down your punishment. It's not that you're reducing the penalty through your own works, but it's simply by God's free gift of salvation. I mean, why would we even want the other things when God's grace is so free and so rich? Some of you are hearing that today and you're hearing it perhaps for the first time and you're hearing God call you to himself. He's saying, I did this for you. It is a free gift for you. If you will come and believe upon me, you can be mine. It's not all about what you're going to change in your own life and what you're going to do. Just turn away from all of that and turn to me and trust and believe in what I have done. You see, and all of this happens through, fill this in, we realize, we need to realize that God's Holy Spirit cleanses us and renews us. Put out there to the side, makes us new. He cleanses us and he makes us new. And we see that in verse 5. It says, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of his Holy Spirit. All of that's in verse 5. So, how does God save you? His Spirit works in you. His Spirit gives you faith. His Spirit calls you to Himself. His Spirit leads you to repentance. You see, Romans chapter 2 says, it's not the wrath of God that leads His people to repentance. It's the kindness of God that leads His people to repentance. He's saying, you can be forgiven. You can have my love. You can come to me and know what it means to be made clean. I'll forgive you of all of your sin. If you will come to me, if you come and cast your faith and your belief upon me, if you'll turn away from the, the foolishness of all of the sin and the surrounding culture around you, if you will turn to me and believe upon me instead of yourself, I'll clean you, I'll cleanse you, I'll make you mine. 
And this happens through the power of the Holy Spirit. So he cleans us, he cleanses us, and he renews us. Look at Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 2. Would you underline, or excuse me, would you read out loud the underlined portion of that? It says, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. You see, he gives you a new heart. When you come to faith, you say, well, that's never happened to me. Well, maybe you need to come to Christ. Maybe that's what you're realizing in this. If he's not giving you a new heart, maybe that, I mean, that's what he does. You talk about Jose's heart surgery yesterday. God really does heart surgery. And he doesn't just fix it up. He gives you a new heart. Notice what he says here. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. So your hardened heart that nobody seems to be able to break through, God says, I'll give you a new heart. I'll give you a heart that is alive. I'll give you a heart that's not stone, but a heart that is real and rich. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved. Look what this, look what comes next. Through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. You see, God comes and what does sanctification mean? He comes and He cleans us. He comes and He, he changes us who we are, and he changes and brings us into conformity with his son. So the Holy Spirit comes and he cleans us and he gives us belief and faith in Jesus Christ. Look at verse 14. To this he called you through our gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is how we come to right relationship with God. John 3, 3. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is what? Born again. You see, the Holy Spirit makes you new. Born a second time. Look what it says. Truly, truly, I say to you, Jesus said, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Some people say, well, that, that sounds like Jimmy Carter, not me. You know, he, he was the one that talked about being born again all the time, and that sounds too religious for me. I'm just not interested in that. I want to just come help me feel better a little bit. No, Jesus says, no, I, I want all of you. I want everything that you are. Just come to me. When you're tired enough and when you're weary enough, come to me. All you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my burden is light. So he, he's calling and he's saying, come and trust. Look at 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... What does it say? He is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. How does that happen? These verses 6 and 7 show us that all of this comes through the power of the Holy Spirit upon us. Look at verse 6 at the box as we close. It says, whom he put Jesus, the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Look at verse 7 so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. You see, this is the reason and the power to live a distinct Christian life. This is how you go home with your wife and you say, are we living like Christians? Or are we living just like the people in the next apartment? Has, has Jesus changed us? Do we have an eternal hope that we're living for? Do we view all of these troubles that we're going through and all of these struggles and sometimes our, our pains and our hurts, do we view all of this as, as God working in our life, helping us to come more in conformity to trust in Him? Or do we just resent it? Do we just live in misery? Are we learning to live by faith and not by sight? Are we learning to love unconditionally instead of having a, whole, a, call, a cold, hard heart that does not open to others? Are we living like Christians? When our kid is 10 years old, when he's 12 years old, when he's 14 years old, is he going to have the same values as the family that doesn't know Christ? Or is he going to say, Daddy, 
my friends don't understand this. They just don't see God's love, or they just don't see how wrong their behavior, they don't see how wrong their speech is. They don't, they don't see the things that we see. It, are, are, is your son, is your daughter going to see the things that you see? You see, if we live distinct Christian lives, and if we are living lives pursuing God in His grace, all because He saved us, it's going to start to show, not only to our children, but to the people that are around us. You see, we need to recognize and fill this in as the end. We need to realize that all this happens, all of this salvation, all this cleansing, all this renewal, it all happens, as we just read, through the substitutionary death of Jesus. What does substitutionary death mean? This is so important. He died in our place. I deserve to go to the cross. But he went to the cross in my place. I deserve to be condemned and cut off from God. But so that I could be reunited with God, he died in my place. And not only did he die in my place, but his victorious resurrection makes it so that I can live. You see, he rose so that I can live. The Bible tells us that if Christ be not raised, then our faith is in vain. So if Jesus was never raised from the dead, then we, we are victims of a scam. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then this book is a lie and has no value. But because Jesus rose from the dead, overcoming sin and death, he gives us eternal life. Now that's a reason to live a distinct Christian life because he has saved us. Two key questions that are not on your outline. The first question is this. I want you to see it. To be deadly honest, in what are you trusting? And I use the word deadly honest because that's the stakes. Are you trusting in your works or are you trusting in the mercy of God through Jesus Christ? Number two, have you been washed and renewed? You say, well, how does that happen? We just read that that happens by coming to faith in Jesus, coming to realize that he is our only hope. Next Sunday, there will be a table right here with a beautiful white linen cloth over it, and it will have some, some beautiful, shiny containers with bread, and fruit of the vine. And those two things remind us of everything that God did so that we might be made new. And so that we might live not in bondage to this world, but rejoicing in Christ. Amen? Let's stand together as we sing.